Note that this presentation is not meant to replace your reading of section 5.3.4 in the textbook. While watching this presentation, it would be very helpful if you follow along in the corresponding portions of that section of the textbook. Lastly, please note that you're responsible for reproducing all parts of this presentation on paper according to our course guidelines for formatting of written work, except for any portions that appear in italics and any slides within the presentation that are specifically identified as not requiring reproduction. Before you go through this video, you should already understand the basics of the hypothesis testing framework, how to perform a hypothesis test using a confidence interval, and the two types of decision errors. And I've supplied textbook references for those three items. This video is going to discuss the mechanics of performing a four-step hypothesis test for a single proportion. The four-step process is given at the top of page 198 of your textbook and it consists of the same four basic steps that we used to construct confidence intervals. And I won't bother reading those. You can read those for yourself. So let's talk a little bit about the idea of a P or probability value. A P or probability value is a way of quantifying the strength of the evidence against the null hypothesis. And it's worth mentioning at this point that when we talk about a hypothesis test, it's always the null hypothesis that we are testing. And in favor of the alternative hypothesis, H subscript A. Here's the formal definition for the p-value or probability value. I will not read that for you. You can read that for yourself. That is right out of the textbook. So let's take a look at an example. We're going to combine example 5.33 from your textbook with the four-step process for performing a hypothesis test for a single proportion shown at the top of page 198. You will need to reproduce all work associated with this example, starting with the problem statement below. So here is an example from the textbook. We have a simple random sample, uh, a simple random sample of 1,028 U.S. adults in March 2013 that show that 56% support nuclear arms reduction. Does this provide convincing evidence that a majority of Americans supported nuclear arms reduction at the 5% significance level? So the first step of our four-step process is to prepare. We're gonna identify the parameter of interest, list hypotheses, identify the significance level, and identify the sample proportion and the sample size. So the example's parameter of interest is P, the proportion of U.S. adults that support arms reduction. The hypotheses are, and we got these from the textbook from Guided Practice 5.32, that the population proportion is equal to 50% or 0.5 for the null hypothesis. And the alternative hypothesis is that the population proportion is not equal to 0.5. Again, keep in mind the null hypothesis always expresses a statement of equality, and the alternative hypothesis always states an inequality. All right, the significance level was given in the problem statement as being 5% or 5 hundredths. And last but not least, we list the sample proportion and the sample size to complete our prepare step. Okay, moving on to step two. We're going to do a check of the two conditions to ensure that the sampling distribution of sample proportions is nearly normal under the null hypothesis. And that's important to stress that we're using the null hypothesis in order to de uh, for values that we need for these condition checks. So for one proportion hypothesis tests, we're going to use the null value that was 0.5 for this example to check the success failure condition. So checking independence first, the poll was a simple random sample of U.S. adults, meaning the observations are independent. Moving on to the success failure condition, we first find that the number of successes is equal to N times the null value of P0, uh, and we get a value of 514 when we do that. The number of failures is N times 1 minus P subscript 0, the null value again, uh, and we find that the number of failures was 514. 
uh, that kind of makes sense that it would be half and half, right? 514 uh, successes, 514 failures, because again, the null value was one half. Since both of these values are greater than or equal to 10, the success failure condition is met. We conclude our check part by stating that lastly, because both the independence and success failure conditions are met, we can model the sampling distribution of sample proportions, p hat, using a normal model. All right, moving on to the third step, calculate. If the conditions hold, which in this case they both did, we're going to compute the standard error, again using the null value, p subscript 0. We're going to compute the z-score and identify the p or probability value. So you can see on the screen, I've shown the formulas for both the standard error and turning the crank, we get a value of 156 ten thousandths for the standard error. And then we find our test statistic, our z-score. And again, turning the crank, taking the point estimate, which again is our uh, sample proportion, subtracting the null value of one half, and dividing that by the standard error, we get three and 75 hundredths for our z-score test statistic value. All right, the next step as part of the calculate process is we're going to form what is called a null distribution sketch, which we will then use to identify the tail areas of interest for computing the p or probability value. So I start by drawing a normal distribution sketch with the null value of 0.5 in the center of my p hat axis. Notice I've scaled it three above and three below for tick marks. And down below, I've also included a z axis. So I begin by scaling the p hat axis. Remember that we had a value of approximately 16 thousandths for our standard error rounded to three decimal places. So I scale it up three standard errors and then I scale below the null value down three standard errors in order to scale my axis. Notice that my values are all written to three decimal places, which is very common for scaling the p hat axis. All right. The next step is I'm going to include some vertical lines going through plus and minus the z-score. So notice that they are outside of the range of 3, 3, and 7,500, 3 and 3 fourths, in other words, to the left and to the right. I'm going to label those down below. Notice that I use absolute value symbols around the z-value to identify the negative absolute value of z, positive absolute value of z. Now let me stop for a moment and explain why we have to include those absolute value symbols. The reason why is because sometimes our z-score might be negative. And when it is, then we have to take the absolute value in order to get a positive value out of that for use on our sketch. So you do need to be careful about including those absolute value symbols when you label the uh, z-score values on the sketch. And then lastly, we're going to go ahead and shade the tail areas corresponding to the P or probability value. That would be the tails to the right and tails to the left. In this case, the tails are off our diagram, so there's nothing to shade, but otherwise you would shade those. And then we would compute the P or probability value using our guru. Now, I will show how to do that in just a moment, but I want to continue on with finishing the sketch. So let's assume that I found the P value using our guru. And I would then go ahead and identify those, uh, identify that on the sketch. Half of the p-value is on the right. So the p-value, which was, it turns out it's going to be approximately two ten thousandths. Half of it is labeled here, one ten thousandth, and half of it is labeled on the left, one ten thousandth. And that would complete our sketch. All right, let's take a moment now to go to our guru and see how to find that p or probability value using these two z-score values of negative 3 and 75 hundredths and positive 3 and 75 hundredths. So within the RGuru program, we now want to go ahead and find the p or probability value corresponding to the z-values of negative 3 and 75 hundredths and positive 3 and 75 hundredths. So we start by going to probability simulation, left click on probability, go to probability calculator, left click on continuous since we are dealing with a normal distribution curve. That's a continuous probability distribution. Notice the radio button for values to probability is already checked because we do have z-score values that we're going to find a probability for. So the distribution is normal, mean is zero, standard deviation of one, and we are looking for the uh, 
area under the curve outside of the lower value of negative 3 and 75 hundredths and the upper value of 3 and 75 hundredths. And we go ahead and click Preview. And notice that my calculator gives me the area that is in the tails outside of those two z-score values. And this would be approximately two ten thousandths. That's what we would round that to. So in closing, it's worth pointing out that when we find p or probability values, we will always round whatever we get from our calculator to four decimal places. Now that we've used our guru to find our p-value and labeled it on the sketch, the final thing you would need to add to the sketch is a statement that gives the p-value. You'll notice I wrote it as p-value is approximately equal to two ten thousandths. And notice that I stated that I found that value using the continuous distribution probability calculator within our guru. Okay, moving on to our conclusion. After we've completed the previous three steps, we next need to evaluate the hypothesis test by con comparing the p or probability value to the level of significance alpha and provide a conclusion in the context of the problem. So the first thing we need to do is evaluate the hypothesis test. And again, remember what we are evaluating is the null hypothesis. We're either going to reject the null hypothesis or fail to reject it. In this case, because our p or probability value is less than the level of significance, in other words, two ten thousandths is much smaller than five hundredths, we reject the null hypothesis. Once we've rejected the null hypothesis, that leads us to the following conclusion. Therefore, the poll provides convincing evidence that a majority of Americans supported nuclear arms reduction efforts in March 2013. And that concludes this presentation.